Wave Strong isn't about Matthew, but his death was a defining moment in our community, which exemplified that the dialogue surrounding mental health needed to be brought to light. With your presence today, we continue to make strides to achieve our mission through three pillars. Scholarships, which are available to those looking to pursue or change their career in the mental health field. Grants, which include helping bridge the gap between payment for mental health services and insurance claim reimbursements, if any. And community awareness, which is the positive messaging that you may have seen throughout town or at your children's schools. The vision for Darianne to heal and prevent more tragedy from happening in our community could not be where it's at now without the guidance and dedication of some of our board members and founders who are here today. So I'd briefly like to, to, to acknowledge them. Rebecca Ashcraft. <laughs> Laura Bremer. <laughs> Kathy Kramer. <laughs> Susan Massey. <laughs> Carolina Magoey. Carrie Potoff and Kim Swift. Thank you for your commitment to, and dedication to our cause. Before we get started on our run, of, I'd like to just tell you about our run of show. Uh, one of our founders, Laura Bremer, will give a brief, a brief insight on how we, get, we got started. Chris Bogart from Sasco River will, will share the importance of partnerships in the community. We'll have a paddle raise with our auctioneer, Charles. Pastor Gary from Neroton Presbyterian is here to give a blessing, followed by hearing from Katie Southworth. And then finally, we'll close with a raffle drawing. And so with that, I would like to hand the microphone over to Laura Bremer, who will share our history. Um, thank you, Tracy. It's so nice to see so many of you here today. I have to tell you, I'm kind of overwhelmed and blown away by all the familiar faces that are in the room right now. Um, and, you know, as we thought about today's presentation, what we wanted to share with you today, we realized that while many of you are intimately aware of what WaveStrong is, right, you've been along on this journey with us for the past two and a half years, there are lots of you that probably don't know very much about what WaveStrong is. So, if you can indulge me with about 10 minutes, we're going to give you a little bit of history um, so that everybody can walk out of here really understanding who we are and even with some very simple things that everyone here can do to really promote the message and the mission of the foundation. So I just want to take us way back to 2022. Um, I think a lot of us in this room can agree that Darianne felt like a very different place in 2022 in the early part of that year when, you know, from a mental health perspective, we weren't really very open. We weren't talking about mental health. We weren't admitting that we all had mental health. We weren't willing to acknowledge that perhaps we were going through a tough time or a family member was going through a tough time or a friend was going through a tough time. And I would say over the last two and a half years, one of the most important things that we've done as, a, as an organization is work really, really hard to take away the stigma that is part of mental health, right? And, you know, that's really how WaveStrong was born. It, it began with a very simple mission that Tracy mentioned and many of you, which is to break down the stigmas, to open up the dialogue, to create the conversations that make it okay, and then also establish strength and community. Not one person or organization has the answer, but if we all work together, we can make tremendous progress when it comes to mental health and the betterment of Darianne. So just to ground everyone, because the word stigma gets thrown around an awful lot, right? Stigmas, everybody understands them, but when you actually look at the actual definition of a stigma, it's pretty awful, guys. It's a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. The stigma of having gone to prison will always be with me as an example. Words that are often used similarly are shame, disgrace, dishonor. So if you are struggling, or if someone you know and love is struggling, 
As hard as that is, can you imagine being worried about the stigmas, the, what people think of you? It's very natural, especially in a town like Darien, to worry about what other people think, right? And we have to do better. That, that, that we have to be able to eliminate the stigmas because the stigmas are what prevent people from getting help in the first place. There's a lot of data around this. I'm not going to bore you with data, but I did want to share one piece, which is, according to the National Institute of Health, it is well documented that societal stigmatization of mental illness is a significant barrier to care. Stigma leads to delayed diagnosis, delayed treatment, reduced quality of life, and an increased risk of social exclusion. So imagine you're going through that and you are faced with this as well. We know locally, thanks to the Thriving Youth recent data, that we have a lot of people in this town who are struggling, who are fearful. I'm not gonna read all the data points, but the youth data points are particularly concerning, right? We know that this is pervasive. We know that this is a problem. And so we're here today because we do have some ways that we can really open up this dialogue and we ask all of you to join us. So where do we start? It's like really big, right? It's, it's overwhelming. Um, it feels insurmountable, but there are some easy things that we can do, right? First and foremost, we have to normalize mental health. We have to stop talking about mental health like you have it, but you don't have it. Everybody has mental health. Everybody will have harder days than others. Everybody's gonna have a tough time. It is what it is. It is called life, and we all need to realize that we all have it, right? The second piece is we have to talk openly about it. We have to create an environment where it's okay to say to a friend, an associate, somebody, you know, I'm having a hard time, or my son's having a hard time, or my friend's having a hard time. Because sometimes when we talk about it, we can find solutions along the way, and if nothing else, you're lending an ear to somebody who may be going through a really difficult time. We need to reinforce that asking for help is a sign of strength, it is not a sign of weakness. Um, and we need to create moments and reasons to engage, right? Like we can't just keep on repeating these things, we need to find ways so we can open up this conversation where we're really resonating, um, especially when it comes to the kids. So we pulled a couple of the highlights. Oh, hold on, not ready, for, not ready. For that, okay. Um, a couple of the highlights so that everybody could get a sense of what we've been up to for the last two and a half years. Um, and this is really not everything, but these are sort of the big, big moments, right? So many of you may know it all started with the t-shirt, right? So in September of 2022, we created a t-shirt that said Wave Strong on the front. It was meant to show that we are coming together as a community and that we were strong together. On the back of that shirt, the goal was to have messages that we knew would be important for people to hear, especially at that time, you know, just six months after we lost two students and several town members to suicide. The messages said, we got your back on the top, speak to someone, because we know often people don't, and at the bottom, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay has been a drum we have been beating for the last two and a half years. It hangs at the bottom of the shirts. You see a lot of the boys and a lot of the athletes make, proudly wearing that message to make sure others can see it. So that was September of 22 and the response was amazing. And we were like, okay, I think we might be onto something. We should probably figure out what to do next. And then the phone rang and Jen Erdlin, I don't know where she is, but Jen Erdlin called <laughs> and she said, you know, the girls' basketball team really wants to do something. They want to do something for Wave Strong. They want to do something around mental health. What can we do? So we quickly rallied. The girls and the boys happened to have a back-to-back doubleheader home game against New Canaan, which is like the perfect tee-up. And then we quickly realized that so did the hockey team. So that became the first Wave Strong weekend, if you will. What happened that weekend was the athletes from these teams went around town with signs that was really fostering the sense of community. We are wave strong. Mental health is important. Help us spread this message. At the games themselves, you know, we had raffles, we had bake sales, but the most beautiful part was the actual students getting up and talking about why this was so important to them and why mental health was so critical. They wanted a voice and this gave them a platform. Following that, or roughly you know, a month later, there's an image on there that has the wave strong sign with two hearts. 
If any one of you have driven through the Oval, you would know that maybe 10 little, you know, elves one night created 100 blue hearts made out of solo cups all around the Oval field. We did that because we wanted to make sure that the Darien High School community felt loved and supported a year after losing our first student to suicide. We felt it was important to give them that, that feeling of community and really wrap our arms around them. We thought that was gonna be up for maybe a couple of days, maybe a week, they stayed up for months. No one wanted to take them down. And at the same time, another local Darien mom, Amy Ofinger, who has since moved, said, you know, the Oval doesn't have a name. We should give it a name. And we should call it Wave Strong Way as a reminder to everyone that there is strength in this community that we are all a part of. So we quickly wrote up a proposal. We went to the town. We went to the Board of Ed. The Board of Ed unanimously voted on it. And, and today, the Oval is named Wave Strong Way, which was amazing. And we really dedicated that. <laughs> We dedicated that really to the class of 2023 because those kids carried this message with them. It is so personal to them and I know that wherever they all are, they are carrying it with them there and that is what this is all about. Moving on from there, we thought, okay, we got all this momentum, what are we gonna do next? Where is there an audience that we need to get in front of? We knew that statistically speaking, boys are a critical audience. Right? They are four times more likely to take their lives, and they are uh, less likely to ask for help. So knowing that, and knowing that we wanted to really help boys understand that asking for help was a sign of strength, we went to Andy Grant, the varsity football coach at Darien High School, with an idea to bring the Darien and New Canaan teams together prior to the Turkey Bowl for men's mental health. It was November, which is Men's Mental Health Month, and um, we just felt that this was an audience that needed to hear it's okay not to be okay, that needed to hear tough football guy, you can ask for help and no one's gonna judge you. We're gonna take that stigma away. And we had over 200 players, coaches, local town officials attend the event in a neutral site. It was the first time that team, those two teams had ever come together off the field in an almost 100 year rivalry. And if you were there, you could hear a pin drop they took those messages in. It was so beautiful, it was so important to them. And we had an amazing group of speakers that night. Tracy, of course, kicked us off. Um, we had Rob Thorson from HT40 Foundation. The event was generously supported by David Genovese from Baywater Properties, Nate Checkets, who is the founder of Roan, who lives in Darien, but grew up and played football in New Canaan. The football players spoke. Um, and we even had over 15 or 16 special messages from professional and retired NFL athletes who recorded messages for these boys to tell them to take care of themselves, to take care of each other, that there is strength in this brotherhood that they have and they should lean on each other, town lines aside. And it was incredible. I'm almost done guys, I swear. <laughs> The next thing, so that was amazing, right? And people would come up to us and say, oh my God, I love that football thing, that was so great. Um, you gotta get to the little kids. How do you get to the little kids, right? We were really saturating the high school, which was important. But we know we need to get to kids younger and younger these days, right? Um, so we got a phone call, again, from another mother in town who um, had a student at Tokenique School, and she said, will you uh, partner with us for Kindness Week? And we said, sure. We had no idea what that meant, but we said yes. We quickly reached out to all the other elementary schools, and everybody does something during Kindness Week. We found it's not very organized, right? So we said, okay, we're gonna do something, and we're gonna partner with you guys on it. So Kindness Week really had three key components. The first was we created kind of lawn signs. You see some examples of them there. Um, with positive messaging, kindness messaging. These were happier messages, right? This wasn't a heavier conversation. It was really meant to talk about why kindness is important, how you treat people is important, the words you use is important. And we kind of dropped them at the schools and they got to school, you know, and it was kind of a big surprise. We didn't tell them we were coming, we just chose to do it. Um, the next thing we did is we had representatives, some of them are here today, from our Wave Strong High School Club, 
who went into the kids' care meetings after school. They talked about kindness, why kindness was important, and um, they just worked with them, right? We know the big kid, little kid formula is really special. But the best part of Wave Strong Week was the video that we created. And the kids from the Wave Strong Club got about 20 different kids, cross-section of you know, student body from um, Post 53 to a lot of the athletic teams, um, to theater, to art. It was really important. Our goal was that if you were a little kid and you saw this video, one of those kids would really speak, oh my god, I love football. Oh my god, I want to play hockey, right? I love art. So they would feel that message. Felt kind of personalized to them. And so we created it with the help of Mitch's Flicks, if you guys know who he is. He's a high school student at Darien who's amazing, who takes pictures and videos of all the teams and events. Um, and what ended up happening was that video was played at every morning meeting at every elementary school that week. And even Dr. Adley played it at the Board of Ed meeting and thanked the Wave Strong Club. So I'm going to play the video. It's three minutes long, but I do think this just this what these kids are capable of and, and what, what is resonating, I think everybody in this room needs to hear as we continue to evolve what we're doing. And last but not least, we have our WaveStrong scholarships. Um, Tracy spoke about you know, um, the key components of our mission, scholarships and supporting students who are looking to continue in education um, to support mental health um, is something that is very, very important. We know that there's a shortage of mental health professionals. We know actually that's predicted to get worse, not better, which is scary given the need is rising, but the practitioners are becoming fewer and fewer. We gave our first Wave Strong scholarships out this past year through the DCA. Um, and we will continue that obviously every year. So, oh, that's going to play again. Okay. All right. So just to wrap up a few things, you know, we talk a lot about Stronger Together. We talk a lot about working together. We talk a lot about the importance of showing up together. We have had amazing partners over the last two and a half years, right? Across DHS, 12 of the varsity teams have participated with us. Theater 308, DAF Media, who's here today. Thank you, Damien. Mitch's Flicks, and of course, our Wave Strong Club, which had the highest number of students sign up last year than any other club at the high school, which is amazing. Across town, we've, we were working with so many different partners, Post 53 and Rotenprez, the Police Department, Baywater, Roan, the Chamber of Commerce, Town of Darien, DY Lax, Nielsen's, The Depot, the Blue Wave Booster Club, the DCA, Darien Community Fund, Greaves, Palmers, Houlihan Lawrence, Helen Anson, and Sale to Sable. And then last but certainly not least are the partnerships we have forged with mental health organizations around town and throughout the state. Um, AFSP Connecticut um, has really been our partner since the very beginning. Michelle Peters has been an incredible resource and sounding board. Everything we do, we speak to Michelle first. NAMI has been an amazing partner, especially with what they're offering at the depot for parents and caregivers of students who are struggling. And Sasco River, who is um, a sponsor today, um, is a wonderful partner. And Chris Bogart's going to get up in a minute and um, talk about that partnership as well. They're also a sponsor of today's event. So just to wrap us here, um, you know, obviously this is very personal to me, to all of our foundation members, to all of our club members, anyone who's participated in this. But really, we all have a job to do. And, and the job is, is not as hard as we think. Um, and these are kind of the key pieces. Remind each other it's OK not to be OK. Be kind and choose to say something nice. Encourage each other to speak up, ask for help, and talk about whatever you're going through. You know, as Rob Thorson and HT40 reminds everyone, and they're a really strong partner of ours, checking in, reaching out, making contact. Just check in with people. It's really not hard. And then repeating the message to ourselves and others, you are not alone. You know, we think there's tremendous strength in this Darien community. Um, we're always looking ways to be stronger together. And, you know, we hope to continue all of this work with so many of you moving forward. But we know there's a lot more to be done, which is where everybody here comes in. We thank you for coming today. This is actually, as a foundation, our very first official fundraising um, event. Um, everything we've done so far has been literally with like scotch tape and paper clips, right? I mean, we're, we've willed it to happen. We've asked for help along the way. But if we can formalize it, 
I think we can really make a tremendous impact in the town. So thank you so much. I think I took more than the 10 minutes I was actually um, told I could have, but I would like to introduce you to Chris Bogart, who is the executive director of Sasco River Center. Um, we definitely have a shared belief that it takes a village to make an impact, and we're so grateful for their partnership. Um, he's gonna share a few words. So thank you so much. Good afternoon. So the first rule of public speaking is never get up after a video with students. Uh, how can you top that? That was just beautiful. And what the incredibly dedicated members of the board of WaveStrong and many of you around here have accomplished in the last couple years is nothing short of spectacular. To be here today and to be amongst uh, so many like-minded people um, and to be invited up to say a few words is a true honor. Um, and so thank you for having me here. Thank you, uh, Tracy and Kim and Laura, for uh, inviting our partnership uh, into this discussion. So my, my comments are going to be relatively brief. Um, but what I wanted to touch on is what we know from the research is the way that we can have an impact in really being able to provide a lifeline to a person who might be considering harming themselves. And so, you know, I know Laura said she was going to be brief on the, uh, the, the statistics. I'm going to be brief on statistics as well, but sometimes it's through the statistics that we actually get a little bit of insight into what's going on and what's working. Um, sort of a little known fact is that uh, death by suicide in the United States actually reached its peak in 1995. So from 1975, when they started really tracking closely some of the statistics on uh, death by suicide, from 1975 to 1995, there was this exponential increase. And then it hit a point, this peak, and then it went down, partly because of a lot of emphasis upon mental health resources, uh, creation of suicide hotlines, some of the different pieces that we know have been a lifeline for many people. And then in 2015, we took a turn again. And from 2015 through the pandemic into the post-pandemic period, that curve became a straight line north. And uh, really started uh, creating incredible increases in number of people who considered suicide, attempted suicide, and uh, died by suicide. And the current research, just so that we don't kind of uh, get stuck on sort of the, the negative side of things, the current research, re research is suggesting that we may have hit a second peak in 2022. And then in 2023, there's like a little notch going downward. 2024, we obviously don't have statistics for the full year, uh, but the early statistics out of uh, the National Institute of Mental Health and some of the uh, agencies that track this show that 2024 is on track right now to be a little bit less than 2023. So the fingers crossed is that we have begun to create messages like WaveStrong of it's okay to not be okay and messages of you need to know that there are resources and support out there. And so one of the things that is most, you know, sort of humbling and also, uh, you know, sort of uh, reassuring to me is the partnership that has been created here in the town of Darien. I've been uh, a psychologist in this community for over 30 years, and to watch the progression from this is something we can't talk about, no, this doesn't exist in our town, no, it certainly doesn't exist in my family, to this place where, yes, it does exist in our town, yes, it does exist in all of our families, yes, there are resources and supports to be able to help us and help our kids to be able to feel like they have a lifeline. That is the critical piece here. And so what the research is showing over and over again across communities is that communities that start to thrive are communities where we have a partnership between 
the public sector, between the private sector, between the nonprofit sector, and those resources come together with that same message of there is help, there is support. The number one key factor in a person who is considering suicide, not attempting suicide, is having a contact to a trusted individual that they reach out to and say, I don't know what's going on, but I am not feeling good. And having that one trusted person is what very often is the tipping balance between what happens next in that person's life. And so it is through these partnerships that we are making progress. We are nowhere near where we need to get to. We're nowhere near being able to say, okay, we've got a handle on this. We don't, but we're making progress, and it's through organizations like WaveStrong that we will continue to make that progress. And so thank you to WaveStrong and to the people who have really pushed this incredible message forward. Please be supportive to this group, and through that support, we'll reach more and more kids and give them that sense that there is support, there is help. We're a community that believes in providing that support. Thank you. Face. She will share with you how she's channeled her pain into beautiful works of art, finding solace in each piece she's created, some of which you will see today. It is my hope having conversations that may be uncomfortable surrounding mental health and seek resources available to support you and your loved ones. It is also my hope that after hearing Katie, you will find hope through the challenges you and your loved ones are facing. Please welcome Katie Southworth. Good morning, good afternoon. It's afternoon now, isn't it? <laughs> it's my honor to speak to you today. And first, I want to thank the founding members of WaveStrong for inviting me. But mostly, I want to thank you all. Because whether you're a lifelong resident to Darien or new to town, we all know that Darien is excellent and high achieving at many things. And today, we catalyze a collective effort to become more excellent at our approach to mental health which I hope we can view by the end of the day as the most important lifelong sport to practice. The only thing I'm an expert in is my own story and what I've learned about wellness through my art. So that's mostly what I'll be sharing with you today using snippets from my new book, Dr. Roji Biff. So today at 30, I'm a full-time artist using color to promote wellness and hope for myself and others. I arrived at this healthy place of passion and purpose only after navigating career shifts, a battle with self-care, and a worldwide pandemic, all of which, of course, happened after losing my mother, Ellie, to suicide at age 21. I am who I am now because I found a way to put my joy and mental health first amid omnipresent darkness. And my journey started here in Darien, like many of you and your kids. Oh, I'm doing it. There we go. <laughs> I was a fiercely competitive student athlete, taking up three varsity sports and several AP honors classes. And while I was often commended for tackling such demanding courses and sports, it came at a price. I struggled greatly with balance, seldom slept, and overworked myself to get into a top-notch university. One time, my brother got up for his 5 a.m. hockey practice and found me still studying for the test that day, at which time he informed me, it's a snow day, idiot, go to bed. So gymnastics was my biggest identity for most of my childhood, and it was also the crux of my bond to my mother, Ellie, who was a former Darien gymnast herself. It's hard to describe what an incredible mother, mom, coach, and community member she was, and how much she is missed. And it's even harder to describe the immense way in which she inspires everything I do today, but I touch on it on page 11. Ellie just had this enduring light inside of her, and she uplifted everything and everyone around her. Fittingly, she wore bright colored clothing most of the time and would often tell me, I really wish you wouldn't wear black. I assumed it was just her preference, but I was completely unaware of the depth of meeting, let alone the foreshadowing. So I grew up knowing that she was a bit different, but I had no idea why when I went off to Colby College and ironically studied psychology, dabbling in painting classes here and there. 
In my book, I reflected upon the moment she told my brother and I about her lifelong struggle with bipolar disorder during my junior year. I was just a daughter learning her mother was sick, and it hurt. She apologized for keeping it a secret and had meant to tell us sooner, but was afraid we'd see her differently. This is the crushing power of stigma. And I don't necessarily wish that she'd told us about her diagnosis sooner. I just wish she'd lived in a world with less stigma where she would have at least felt more comfortable telling us when she was sad or down, because she didn't do much of that either. And a mere eight months later, it was too late when I got that awful phone call no one ever wants to get. And that happened two weeks before my senior year. And there were a great number of reasons why I was able to survive this undeniable tragedy, and I don't have time to credit them, but please know that finding my art practice, what I'm gonna talk about, is just one small piece. It's no coincidence that senior fall is when painting transformed from an intellectual curiosity to a profound healer. When I would discover color as a language and a tool for expression, and one anecdote sticks out in particular. I was working on a pink and orange piece, and I was stuck on it, staring at it forever, and out of nowhere, I just started sobbing. With cathartic tears streaming down my face, I realized that pink and orange were precisely Ellie's aura. It was warm, energetic, fun, loving, and strong. And I could feel her love coming to me through the piece. So I followed this newfound magic with color into senior spring, which led to an accidental double major in studio art. And participation in the senior capstone art show was required. So this ended up being my first art show, and I remember being proud enough just to have put vulnerable work on the wall, like the pink and orange piece. And then to my shock, I was awarded a merit-based scholarship prize for my work. I had never won anything in anything other than sports. So it was weird because it forced me to pause and notice what it felt like to have others find worth in something I thought was only important to me. That was a week before graduation, and it was the first time I thought to myself, I think I might be an artist. So while this was obviously a paramount uh, identity development moment for me, life was happening so quickly at this time, it almost slipped away. Here's what it sounds like to fit five years into one sentence. Ready? I moved to Boston, did a service year, got a master's degree at Tufts, got hired right out of my program, and worked for Boston Public Schools as an elementary school art teacher for three years. I wasn't painting in that healing way that I discovered at Colby at all. And it wasn't until after my first full year of teaching that I realized I wasn't doing well, despite appearing successful on paper. I was working so hard I forgot how to take care of myself. I threw myself into work because any time I slowed down, all I felt was heartbreak. I missed my mom, and I hadn't taken much time to grieve her at all. But grief is like a pet elephant. You can only cover it with a blanket, lengthen the leash, and pretend it's not there for so long. Sooner or later, you're going to have to confront, tame, and set free that elephant slowing you down on the way to the rest of your life. So basically, I realized that this weird, unnerving thing called free time was actually life. And I realized I needed to heal if I wanted to live. I knew in my heart I had to get back to painting to get there, so while typical people my age were spending their hard-earned money on traveling, dining out, concerts, I spent mine on my first art studio and art supplies. And you can tell from my face here how badly I needed it. And this I can't make up. I got the keys to this first studio in February of 2020, right before the pandemic hit. So very long story short, basically I ended up with way more time than I allotted to get back in touch with my practice. And what I learned felt like tasting forbidden fruit. And here's a little excerpt that describes what it felt like. The color coaxed the feelings out of me like animals that had burrowed for a long winter sensing sunshine. Some of those feelings were joyful and beautiful. Others were painful, ugly, and scary. But either way, every time, they were better out than in. The first thing I learned was also the most important. Painting was not just a hobby, it was undeniably my method of healing and self-care and joy. So I spent the next year and a half doing both, right? Teaching and making art on the side, but that quickly turned into a demanding jobby. And naturally, I burned out. I realized I had a choice to make, so I spent a lot of time thinking about what choosing each one would mean to me. Choosing art meant being the change I wanted to see in the world. It meant being brave enough to put my joy, passion, and mental health first 
and figuring out the rest along the way in a world that typically asks you to do the opposite. It meant investing in myself, betting on me, and believing in my art as the most unique and valuable thing I could offer the world. It meant choosing a life bold and vibrant enough to honor my mom's legacy and make her proud. So in short, COVID gave me the gift of perspective. I learned who I was supposed to be or who I had the power to be if I chose to. So with the support of people who believed in me, I wrote my resignation letter in August 2021. Was I 100% ready? Maybe not. But like all gymnasts know, sometimes you just have to take that leap and trust your training to land it safely. So today, just because I can call myself a full-time artist doesn't mean that I've made it. Rather, I make it every day like a bed. This job is extraordinarily hard, but after everything I've been through and learned about myself, it's the exact kind of hard that works best for me. And I get closer to my best self every day. I haven't looked back. So I've chosen this life that's a constant challenge, but I love it because it's mine. It's hard to explain when that generic question almost always comes up in small talk conversations. So what do you do? It's not really socially acceptable to answer with this, which is the closest I've been able to explain it in words. Simply put, color is evidence of light. Light is energy. Energy is joyful. And joy is what makes us feel alive. Joy is the bridge between merely surviving and truly thriving. And my job, as I see it, is to manipulate color in a way that harnesses the most possible joy, peace, and calm for myself and others. When I do my job well, color becomes the ultimate tool for storytelling, mood alteration, and metaphor. Color makes me feel better, helps me process things, brings me clarity, and allows me to share my discoveries with you in that order. The more I rinse and repeat that method, the closer I get to answers, manifestation, and hope for change. So there is so much more in my book, but now that you know the most important moments that brought me here in front of you today, I'd like to pivot to sharing some of my thoughts on wellness using some of my paintings and coinciding writings. So when I think of Wave Strong, it gives me hope that collectively we're on our way to change, and it reminds me of a piece of mine called Ebb and Flow, about which I write. Sometimes it's easy to lose ourselves in the highs of life. It's during the lows when we have to take an honest look at ourselves, muster up courage, and move forward. It's why many of us retreat to water in times of uncertainty. It's nature's greatest mirror. I really like this imagery of us all being part of a wave made up of water, which acts like a mirror. Because as with all change, it starts with looking deeply at ourselves. This painting is called Number One. It's normal, healthy, and important to place yourself at the center. Self-care is affirming each day that you're surrounded by love, and that love starts from within because we're all pink on the inside. And at the end of the day, it's just us and the skin we're in against the world. That's why taking care of you first matters. Parents, in this lifelong sport of mental health, please know that you are both coaches and active participants. Your kids will learn from what you teach directly, but perhaps more from what you model from the sidelines. After all, mental health is not a sport with seniority or hierarchy. It's not one with winners and losers. And it's certainly not one that you only play when you're struggling. I think it would help us all if we thought of it as one big level playing field where we're all learning and teaching each other along the way as teammates. Your kids might look up to you as the pros, but this is false and places too much pressure on you. It works the other way as well, and this is something I learned from teaching. The most emotionally healthy people are four-year-olds. Their inhibition allows them to ask very honest questions, make astute observations, and best of all, when they have big feelings, they let them out. So we adults can take just as much uh, inspiration from this vulnerability and honesty as much as they can afford regulatory methods from us. Also, what matters most on the field isn't speed, but rather consistency, authenticity, small steps, and eventually, Evolution. True evolution is small, excuse me, slow, gradual, persistent, made up of repeated habits, small steps, commitment, and trust in the process, much like each gradient in this piece. Sometimes I get frustrated in the slowness, but realizing I'm slowly building the best version of myself makes me excited for the future. 
If you're new to self-care, I invite you to think about it the way I have many times, like an exciting opportunity to improve your life, like learning a new game, like pickleball. Anyone can pick it up at any time. But to get better, you're going to have to build some new muscles. As a former gymnast, let me tell you, new muscles don't just show up overnight. They need regular toning. Big life changes usually require you to build new muscles, and not just physical ones. Mental and emotional fitness are actually more important, and those invisible muscles need just as much consistent attention to grow. So every, every new or healthy, uh, joyful habit I find in my life feels like a new drill that I add to my routine and always have on standby. For me, they range from big things like cooking with diverse whole foods to small things like keeping flowers in the house. And occasionally, my friends will tag along for these activities, but an important note is that most of the time, I do them on my own. And that was hard at first. But I constantly recommend alone time for anyone looking to take the hard road to joy that works, rather than quick Band-Aid fixes that don't last or copying what makes others happy. And I capture this principle in my piece called Out There. Venturing on your own can be scary, but exploring what this world has to offer teaches you who you are. And eventually you learn how to love yourself, enjoy your own company, and in learn what you can offer to someone else. In my journey, I found color. That's my joy. And everyone deserves their unique journey. But if I could be so bold as to offer one piece of advice to everyone, I'd recommend learning active listening. It's a powerful tool to breed honest conversation with those you love and make someone else feel seen, heard, and safe, almost like they have a home with you. Which reminds me of docked. Fortunate is the person who knows that feeling of coming home, having a safe place to continuously return to. It can be a house, a person, or a pylon, but everyone needs a dock, a place to ride out the storms. So in the midst of honest conversation with people you love, you might find some things within each other that aren't perfect, pretty, or maybe not the most healthy, and that's okay. I think what unites us is that we're all imperfect, and it's time we start meeting each other with honesty and vulnerability. I have one piece about vulnerability that's probably my favorite, called City Neon. I think there's a lesson to be learned from City Neon. Its job is to stick out and say, I'm here, notice me, please come in, to make itself known when it would otherwise be engulfed, bypassed, and forgotten about in the darkness. It welcomes people in who otherwise wouldn't know they were needed. Vulnerability is neon. It lets people know you need them. So I think it's rather simple. We all need people, we all need support, because we all have stuff. Eliminating stigma means recognizing that it's perfectly fine to have some stuff. It matters way more what you go and do with it. This is what I've done with mine. And I got there because I had non-judgmental support, empathetic ears, and space to learn who I really was. And I'm 100% sure that if we lift each other up out on that level playing field, that everyone, no matter what they've been through, can arrive at a healthy, perhaps more colorful life of joy. Wave Strong is a pillar of hope in this endeavor. And thanks to all your support, we will provide that healthy environment for our town and the people we love. And speaking of love, I just have one more piece to share, called Mother's Love. Just because she's not physically here anymore doesn't mean I can't feel it every day. It's in me. And sometimes it's as simple as being a bright spot in someone else's day to remember it. So Wave Strong, thank you for allowing me to be what was hopefully a bright spot in your day today. Please do the same for others. And cheers to Wave Strong. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for sharing your story in uplifting words. If you would like to view Katie's artwork, 
the private dining room just up these stairs has her artwork on view. Some of it is for sale, and a, por a portion of the proceeds will go to Wave Strong. There's also a few auction pieces behind at the back of the room that are, um, that are also provided by Katie. Thank you very much. And as you leave today, remember, we are stronger together. We are Wave Strong. Thank you very much for coming today.